Take a look at this electrocardiogram. What is your opinion on it? What potentially severe and fatal ideologies could generate this type of alteration? In our previous video, we concluded by presenting this ECG for you to ponder. Today, we bring you the answer. Welcome back to another engaging lesson focused on electrocardiographic tracings. In this session, we will dive into a discussion about various electrocardiogram patterns. In the following trace, a 52-year-old male patient presents to the emergency department with this electrocardiogram. I suggest pausing the video to carefully analyze the ECG before I begin discussing it in detail. In this trace, we observe that the patient maintains a sinus rhythm, which is tachycardic with a frequency above 100. What catches our attention the most, even if we look at this electrocardiogram from a distance, is the clear alternation between the QRS complexes. We have one QRS complex that is slightly larger, and then the QRS amplitude becomes smaller, and this pattern continues throughout the entire electrocardiographic trace. This electrical alternation, especially when associated with a sinus heart attack, suggests the presence of a pericardial effusion. So we have what is called a swinging heart, it appears to be floating within the pericardial sac, which is filled with fluid. As the heart beats, it changes its position within the pericardial sac, sometimes moving away from and sometimes approaching the electrodes. This results in the observed electrical alternation or beat-to-beat -beat variation. This electrocardiogram is highly suggestive of a pericardial effusion. It's important to note that the presence of low-voltage QRS on an electrocardiogram also suggests pericardial effusion, not just electrical alternation. However, in addition to pericardial effusion, there are other causes that can lead to low-voltage QRS. Among them are artifact, meaning that during the electrocardiogram, a smaller amplitude was chosen, such as half N, where N is the normal amplitude we typically use for electrocardiographic traces. If someone accidentally reduces the gain on the device, we may see a non-pathological low-voltage QRS complex resulting from the incorrect configuration of the electrocardiogram device. Patients with Addison's disease may also present with low-voltage QRS. Anasarca as it increases the distance and impedance between the heart and the electrodes position around the thoracic cage. Patients with infiltrative cardiac diseases, such as amyloidosis or neoplasia, heart transplant recipients, patients with cardiomyopathies or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, those with constrictive pericarditis or hypothyroidism. In these cases, sinus bradycardia is usually also associated. Patients with left pneumothorax, resulting in a reduction of the amplitude of electrocardiographic signals in the left-sided leads. Patients with extensive anterior myocardial infarction, which leads to a reduction in muscle mass and consequently, the generation of the electrocardiographic impulse. Patients with acute or chronic myocarditis. Obese patients as the distance between the heart and electrodes is typically increased. Patients with pleural effusion, similar to those with pneumothorax. Lastly, as we have seen, patients with pericardial effusion or tamponade. In these cases, sinus tachycardia is generally associated with the previous electrocardiogram. Continuing with our lesson, we will now present two electrocardiograms to you. These ECG are from two patients who arrived at your clinic simultaneously, both experiencing chest pain. Both patients are 50 years old, and you'll need to make a decision regarding their care. While both patients should be referred to the hospital, one of them will require immediate attention and prioritized referral. We will display the ECG of these two patients for you to determine which one should be given priority in treatment and why. Here is the first electrocardiographic tracing. I suggest pausing the video to carefully analyze the ECG. Now let's move on to the second tracing, which represents the second patient with the same chest pain symptoms, also 50 years of age. Again, I suggest pausing the video to carefully analyze the ECG. Returning to the first tracing for discussion, we can observe a sinus rhythm with no alterations in the QRS complex axis and the QRS complex itself. 
Upon examining the ST segment, we can see an elevation of the ST segment in nearly all leads, most prominently in D1, D2, D3, a VF, and from V3 to V6. Additionally, we can observe a depression of the ST segment in a VR, associated with an elevation of the PR segment in a VR and a depression of the PR segment, particularly in the lateral wall from V4 to V6. This case is highly consistent with what? An acute pericarditis presentation, as there is elevation of the ST segment in almost all the walls, except for a VR, where we have a depression. Associated, there is a depression of the PR segment, most visible from V4 to V6, combined with an elevation of the PR interval in a VR. This ECG is strongly suggestive of acute pericarditis. Analyzing the next electrocardiographic tracing, we also observe a sinus rhythm. However, there is a noticeable change. The electrical axis seems to display a borderline leftward deviation, accompanied by an elevation of the ST segment. However, this time we don't see the elevation of the ST segment in all the walls. It is primarily visible in the anterolateral wall, V1 to V3, D1, and a VL. Along with this, when we have localized elevation in a specific wall, in this case, the anterolateral wall, we usually see depression in the opposite wall as if it were a mirror image when it results from ischemia rather than early repolarization or another cause. What can we observe in the inferior wall? We see an elevation in the anterolateral wall and a depression in the inferior wall. Thus, this ECG strongly suggests an acute myocardial infarction. We can already notice from V1 to V3 that there is a reduction in the R wave amplitude, which means the QRS complex is not progressing as much, likely due to the onset of wall necrosis. The main diagnosis is an anterior acute myocardial infarction with a less significant lateral component. This patient should be prioritized for referral to the emergency department and immediate care. Here we present a new electrocardiogram, which is more of a tricky case. We know that the following patient is healthy, but why is she crying? We have provided the ECG for your review. Take a look at this electrocardiogram. What is your opinion on it? Don't miss the answer in our next class on real ECG clinical case studies. Subscribe so you don't miss out. Thank you for taking the time to learn with us today. Please share this video with your colleagues, subscribe to our channel, and give us a positive evaluation. We hope to see you soon in our next video.